everyone. I'm Elaine Wu from Sys Studio Edge AR and the Marketing Partnership. Today, I'm very glad to have invited an innovative team to share their work on machine learning powered automated microscope image analysis. And also, they leverage the GPU enabled edge computing with the devices with seed NVIDIA JSON family products. So, they are Christopher R. Field and Kevin G. Field, brothers and co founders of Sierra Scientific, along with Mika. Volkov and CEO and the Vocal Labs. So hi, hi team, hi Chris, uh, hi Chris, Kevin, Mikhail. Welcome to our show to uh, bring your uh, solution about the ML uh, enabled imaging analysis on the microscope. Yeah. What about let us uh, to have a uh, quick introduction about yourself? Yeah. So um, hello, my name is Chris Field of Cellia Scientific, where I am the president and co-founder. For the last 15-ish years, I've been creating scientific software and hardware in academic, government, and industrial environments. At Thea Scientific, I work to automate microscopy, image, and data analysis workflows using the Theascope platform. Kevin? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Kevin Field, and yes, Chris and I are, are brothers. Um, of course, Chris is the older one, but he isn't necessarily the better one, but that's for debate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am acting as the vice president of Thea Scientific and also the associate professor at University of Michigan. Uh, and my background is primarily in microscopy and doing that for a bunch of different type of applications, including additive manufacturing, nuclear materials, and uh, advanced um, material development. And so I'll pass it over to Mikhail to give his introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Mikhail Volkov, and I'm CEO and founder of Volkov Labs. I love working on innovative projects and finding elegant solutions for non-standard tasks, such as Theoscope project with Chris and Kevin. Volkov Labs also produces YouTube tutorials to answer questions from the Grafana community and maintain one-of-a-kind open-source Grafana plugins. We are very proud of. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction and I uh, look forward to your uh, demonstration and also uh, explaining how you design this whole application for microscope. Yeah, I'll hand over to you, Chris, uh, to share about uh, Chris and Kevin to share about your innovative technology. Sure. Give me a moment and let me uh, share my screen. Let's see if this works. There we go. Can you see the screen? Yes, we do. All right. Um, so yeah, so today we're gonna talk about uh, machine learning powered automated microscopy image analysis. And I'm guessing at the beginning, people are wondering what is a uh, microscopy? So I'm gonna actually hand it over to our resident uh, microscopy guru, Kevin, and to introduce microscopy and the problem that we're trying to solve. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So um, as you can see in the slide here, we have one of the microscopes at University of Michigan. And this looks same, but very different across a bunch of different types of microscopes. Um, but generally speaking, the current kind of modern microscopes have some uh, microscope itself, but a whole range of digital interfaces attached to it. And that can be the microscope, microscope control computer. There's also say uh, secondary camera controls, as well as a bunch of different other spectroscopy and other types of uh, imaging techniques that can go into these different types of microscopes. And these microscopes can image anything from a couple of millimeters all the way down towards resolutions that are um, smaller than a human hair um, as uh, in it. But really the, the complexity of these current modern microscopes with digital data streams and so on and so forth keeps on increasing and it's really increasing um, also the demand for kind of live and dynamic studies. We wanna see how things happen um, directly onto the microscope uh, as we do things like uh, add temperature or change the, um, the atmosphere or do any other type of kind of dynamic application uh, for that. But these uh, microscopes, uh, they're generating more data than they ever have before. They, they have the capacity for doing lots and lots of images and even video and so on and so forth and resolutions as high as 4K or 8K nowadays. 
um, but they have um, certain issues associated with them. And that's really comes down to how the data workflow happens. So most microscopists are gonna sit on a microscope like you saw one of our students sitting there um, in the previous slide, and they're gonna interact with that microscope in order to collect the data. So they're gonna turn knobs to change the magnification or increase the or uh, um, change the focus, and they're gonna directly acquire that data on the computers that are there. Then they will typically take that data and they'll take it home or they'll take it back to the office and they'll do some type of quantification on a separate machine. And that could include doing things of just saying, yes, it's a, a good piece of equipment they're looking at or a bad piece or so on and so forth. Or it could be as complicated as trying to figure out the morphology of uh, hundreds of different particles that are in a single image. And that translates directly towards this ability for analyzing the data and understanding that data and understanding trends in the images. And that leads to a bunch of different types of scientific discoveries. And that can be ranging from uh, within the medical field into the energy sector and in transportation and so on and so forth. And this workflow can take on the order of just a couple of minutes for somebody to do it up into days or even years, depending on the complexity of the entire workflow. Um, and this is one of the problems we're trying to solve is we're trying to speed that workflow up but also get around these other issues with um, how modern microscopes are interfaced with the modern internet. And that's really that there's data firewalls that exist where your acquisition um, computer and your microscope may not be able to talk to your laptop. You may not be able to pull data directly off of that. You have to do some type of physical actual data translation as it goes. And that can happen in multiple points between the acquisition and quantification step point or the analysis and kind of towards the discovery or any endpoint in between. And so <clears throat> what we've been trying to do is develop our Thescope technology to take some of these pain points away from our customers and away from microscopists and enable that full workflow directly on the microscope. And so we're trying to evaluate or, or um, trying to eliminate these different pain points, which includes that it's um, most of the quantification is manual. So we still use our um, human power in order to do the identification and quantification, which means it's also slow. So that's within the workflow. And then also there's these uh, environmental factors that include things like the microscopes are typically not connected to the internet um, and that every microscopy challenge is unique. Some people might be trying to look at cancer cells, where my research group might be trying to look at small defects that are created to irradiation. And that requires special uh, quantification techniques, special visualizations, which ultimately leads also to the needs for different computation and API capabilities. So that, has, <clears throat> as I had said, has led us towards this path of developing a capability for deployable smart microscopy. And that really means being able to deploy a lot of these different technologies that we were just hearing about directly on or really close to the microscope. And the need is that those uh, technologies have to be able to host a variety of different artificial intelligence and machine learning models. Uh, because as we said, different microscopists might have different challenges and they might use a different model that might be more effective or less effective for different problems. It has to um, interoperate with existing types of image acquisition. Every different microscope looks different, just like cars on the road. They're not all the same, and they don't all have the same type of interface for um, doing certain functions as they go. So you have to have a software hardware platform that can translate between the different ones, um, which also ties towards being platform agnostic. And in many microscopes, they, you're not allowed to install the software or any type of software directly on the microscope computer. And so we have to have something that has zero installation, but is also easy to use, easy to interface, um, and it can operate continuously without any type of internet access. As we had said, the environment um, basically restricts you sometimes from having internet access. And of course, we want it to be fully adaptable to every user use case. So we want them to be able to put it into um, they are green colors if they want it or Michigan blue colors or any other type of color of image that they're trying to look at as well um, in order to keep branding and also keep things consistent with their previous workflows before.
And so this has led to the Theosco platform. So thank you, Kevin, for the introduction to the problem space and also to the uh, pain points and workflow for microscopists. And here we have what is become our Theoscope, where we're going to use an edge computing device with a GPU mounted onto it so that we can then host our AI ML models. We have a time series database on there so that we can collect things as a series of uh, time stamped images, which helps us correlate and aggregate data from multiple instruments over time. We're able to then um, export that data in a variety of different formats so that we can take it to other instruments or we can take it to other computers, but also make sure that we're keeping the openness of the platform available for everybody. And then what all we're going to do is we're going to connect that edge computing device to the microscope through a local area network. But we also, if there are, we are finding that some microscopes and some people do have access to the internet in a sort of um, secure manner from a microscope, then we can also do over the air um, access and do updates and push updates to our device, but also push data back and forth in a more uh, seamless fashion in that way. And so this platform and this architecture ultimately allowed us to then all you really need is a web browser on your computer and every computer out there now has a web browser built into it um, that is capable of running our software. And so we're hosting a web stack for our application on the edge computing device. And we went with the Jetson uh, family of edge computing devices and uh, that are provided by seeds and others, but um, provided by seeds to do this so that we can get around those pain points in the environment of the microscope. And we went through actually the entire family of devices from the Nano up to the Orin uh, in the NVIDIA uh, family of products. And we found that the minimum not that we need from a performance standpoint for the type of models that we're using and for the type of application that we're going to be demonstrating a little bit later is this Xavier NX. But then recently they released the Orens and this is what we're actually going to be doing the demonstration on um, in just a moment. So to talk a little bit about that and a little bit more, um, I'll hand it over to Mikhail who can talk a little bit more about this web stack that we're using for and the technologies involved in the software side of things for the Theoscope. Thank you, Chris. So, so uh, as, as Chris mentioned, we started to use Orin, and now on this uh, slide, you can see there is a new uh, seed machine T906, 906, uh, which is a great for production environment when, um, where Dev, Dev Kit is great for development, but Seed Studio device is more for production uh, environment in a, like a factory. Uh, what we based on, we based, as we mentioned, on Grafana for the UI. And this uh, Grafana UI interacts with the API based on Ray framework, which is one of the best framework and from performance point of view, best in class for AI models. And uh, one device is easy to deploy and manage. When you have uh, tens or hundreds of devices, it uh, became uh, not that easy. And for that, we use Balina platform, which allows us to pack all applications different parts of the application, different Docker containers. And then when we pack the release, we push the release to all the devices at the same time. And some of them are directly connected to the internet and they can pull the updates and update. A, some of them, which is um, in closed environment, they can get the update only when it's going to be manually connected to the internet. But as soon as it's connected, it gets all the updates and uh, all the users have the latest version of the software. And uh, as the Kevin mentioned, uh, all the users will have wanted to customize their interface the way how they look according to their workflow. Grafana provides this kind of uh, capabilities to customize, to show the metrics they're interested in, and to adjust to their workflow the way how they like it. Next slide. And this is one of our experiments based on NVIDIA Jetson Orin and uh, x86 uh, nvidia video card so Thescope uh, is capable to run on jetson ajx nx on orange as well and uh, on x86 platform and also this is what's one of our experiment what we can do if you get an Orin, and Orin has pci express slot and we put nvidia card and with the proper drivers you can have both and ray framework actually allow you to do that. Uh, Ray framework allow you to have the server master nodes uh, architecture. When you have one head node, 
and any any number of uh, additional nodes can be connected to it and work together and you can process and when you take your images from a microscope you can do you can run one particular model on that or you can run 10 different models on the for this experiment at the same time and save everything to the time scale database Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can see that is a, a full stack, the software design, and also uh, use the hardware with the JSON. So uh, I can tell your the applications. Uh, so uh, for the whole road, uh, you use the NVIDIA cards with the orange, but you also have the uh, other application Mikhail has showed us uh, that is without the card, um, also based on the orange. So I'm curious about why you choose uh, JSON orange, because orange have a, a much leap forward of the AI performance offering um, around the 300 types of the AI performance. So I want to know the uh, when you design the applications, uh, how you leverage this GPU performance? Yeah, so we chose the Orin um, because it has a large GPU memory size, uh, was one of the things that sort of called out to us as we get ready for the transition to 4K and 8K images and electron microscopy. But we also wanted to be able to run multiple models um, with a single GPU and achieve sort of model latencies or frame rates very similar on par to human vision. So we can provide an augmented reality-like experience for our Thea scale users. And that increased performance that you see with the, the Orin allows us to do that and be able to do that with that larger image sizes. So there's also this kind of concept of a, a proof of concept of a, a self-driving microscope, which is akin to a self-driving car, and that higher performance is going to be needed in order to implement those self-driving microscopes in the future. We are able to leverage that performance from the Orin um, basically by creating some specialized Docker containers and, um, and the Ray platform, as Mikhail mentioned, that provides a kernel level access to the Jetson um, Linux 4 Tegra or L4T drivers and the NVIDIA Jetpack from that. Great, thank you. And I wonder besides uh, their, uh, their GPU performance, so how, um, what other benefits you have, um, what other benefits that is provided by this full system devices and also as a dev kit? Yeah, so other other than the advanced uh, AI features, the one of the reasons we went with Siege Jetson Bates products are its compact form factor, like here with the T906 is an example, which is an Orin based um, product and it comes in a form factor that is very laboratory friendly and also very friendly to um, be a portable application in the sense that users want to carry the device along with their samples from one instrument to another instrument, maybe across campus in the case of the University of Michigan, and they want to be able to have that. So having that kind of um, form factor and compactness really helps us out uh, in that case. And we also have learned, though, that um, there's a lot of reconfiguration that we can do with the, the seed uh, products when it comes to this so that we can really tailor the hardware specific to a, a user. We also really enjoy and really appreciate the open hardware designs and sort of the ethos behind that because it aligns with our preference for using open source software and participating in the open source community in general. And the availability is great too. Seeds always seems to have um, the very first iterations of the new uh, next generation GPU. So being able to get our um, out ahead on those and develop our application with this, the cutting edge technology is really great. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, yes, I, I remember uh, in the uh, previous day, you used uh, Xavier and Yax, and then once Jason Orin DevKit have released, you very fast migrate to the Orin, and then use the full system uh, of the uh, T906. Uh, yeah, so, and also along with the Orin and Yax, so I, I wish we can also provide um, a March, uh, uh, the early access to this latest technology to other developers and the companies. Yeah. Yes, great. So let us uh, take a look like how uh, sales groups and this groups the, this technology and how the applications usage based on the uh, based on our JSON products in action. Over to you, Chris. Great, thank you. Yes, let's um give me a moment. Let me pull up our 
our software for the uh, Judson Oren that we have running with the Theoscope software and system. So what we have here is, uh, give me one second just to reset. What we have here is our um, Grafana interface that Mikhail will mention talk about a little bit later, but we see we have some usage stats for our um, ORM. We see that we're not currently using any of the GPU, but we will in just a moment. And we're able to go over to our model management panel here, and we can go ahead and start by spinning up a model. We'll start a model. I'm going to pick a YOLO V5 small um, cavities model that the University of Michigan has been developing and working on. Uh, this is a V5 one. There are other versions of the YOLO family of models out there, but we'll start with that one. And to do that, I click on the add model button. We have this drawer that slides out and allows us to tune a bunch of the different features and a bunch of the different configuration parameters for the model, but also the image processing. So we can use the entire GPU or we can use a fraction of the GPU if we want in this case. And then we can also increase the amount of multi-threading or multi-processing, uh, taking a, advantage of the larger number of CPU cores that are also available on the Orans as opposed to the past generation of devices. We can also set up and change our brightness, contrast, and gamma on the image processing. We can invert the pixel images, and we can change to a grayscale if we wanted to. All this is basically to configure and to optimize the detections and the results that we're going to get from our model as we give it various images from different data sources. And then we can also adjust our confidence threshold to screen or filter out various detections and other parameters in that case. For this one, we're just going to start with the default parameters, and we'll go ahead and do um, hit the start button. And so what's going on now is it's spinning up. It's loading up the model onto the GPU. We we'll see we're going to use the entire GPU in this case. We're waiting for it to initialize, and now we're running. So with our YOLO V5 for Cavity's model up and ready to go, we're going to go ahead and go straight to an acquisition. So in this case, we go to automatically a dashboard that is set up to acquire images and run inference using that model we just started. And what we'll do right off the bat is we can start with, we can do a screen capture, we can run a camera, or we can upload a file. And what I'm going to do is I actually upload a file really quickly and just kind of show what this kind of looks like in action. And here's a, a typical image of cavities that may have been acquired on a microscope previously and then transferred over to another computer through a thumb drive or a network share drive or something like that. We have this yellow box here, which is our field of view. Uh, and this allows us to focus in on a particular area and have the model only run on the inference in within this field of view. But for this case, let's go ahead and do the full image. All right, so we'll expand all to there. We can also change our brightness contrast and gamma here as well, but let's just analyze and see what happens. So there we have our preview. On the left-hand side was the acquisition. On the right-hand side is our single image uh, inference, and we got about 31 uh, cavities were detected with an average score of about 66%, which is pretty good uh, in this case, and it's about what a human would be able to do if you're looking at the preview image versus the image on the right. Now, a single model is great, uh, our single image is great. We can sit here and manually upload one image after another, but we know that scientists and microscopists such as Kevin and his students and group at the University of Michigan have thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of images they want to analyze. So let's also, we've been talking a little bit about and hinting at this real-time microscopy image analysis, and so let's do that. And in this case, I'm going to stop looking at the individual images, and I'm going to do a screen capture. And I'm going to uh, start up our simulated electron microscope in this case, which is a video that was pre-recorded. So we see here we have this video, and I'm going to hand it over to Kevin while I work through this to show the demonstrated to kind of explain what are we looking at, Kevin? Yeah, so this is a common interface for one of the electron microscopes. And what you have is two images on the left and on the right. They're just different ways of looking at the sample themselves. It's very similar to the idea of like looking at something with uh, sunglasses on and then looking at something without sunglasses on, you just get a little bit different contrast. Um, and this is a very common type of imaging and it's a very common type of um, interface where you're gonna have some information on the right that tells you things like what magnification you're at, what focus you're doing, what's the um, different colors that might be present in the image. And within those images themselves, we're actually trying to find these little blobs. And so on the left image, that would be a black blob. On the right, it's a white uh, blob. 
or what we would call a cavity or bubble that's present in the material. And so typically, when we're running these type of experiments, we would have a sample, we would find a region of interest like has been done here. Um, and what we would want to then do is try to quantify that data. And so what Chris is doing is placing the uh, field of view, the yellow box around the image on the right, which is the one that the model has been trained for. And you can see that it's actually finding and doing the data collection on the right. And so when a microscopist would take this image, they would want to know things like what's the size of all of those features or those cavities that are present in the material and what's the number density. And that really ends up telling us a lot about how that material is going to perform. So typically the more you have, it's actually the worse it is. It's kind of like your golf score. You want to have it as low as possible uh, as you go. And so we're really trying to evaluate that as we go. Um, and then when the microscopist has quantified or finished that uh, region of interest or taken an image, then they will um, end up then moving to different regions of interest. So as you see this, you'll actually see the image move and you'll eventually see it change magnification and move to different directions uh, as it goes. But what Chris has actually just done is also some light image processing in order to make the model um, work also on the image on the left. And so what he's actually done is invert the colors because that machine learning model is trying to find white features on a black background. And, but you can see on the image on the left, that's not true. But if we invert it and show the image on the right, we actually have that response uh, as part of that. And we get almost the same type of quantification on the size and the number density of those features. And so right now you can see the microscopist would actually be moving to different regions. And that's why that image is shifting and changing and they're moving uh, over and looking. And what you'll see is that the model in real time is actually identifying those cavities and those features as we go. And eventually you'll see it actually too, is the inversion will actually uh, cause it, the invert back will actually cause that model to no longer be able to detect. And then we'll have to detect on the right uh, as we go. Cool. Great. So let's go ahead and that is real-time microscopy image analysis. And what we'll do now, though, is that's one component of our software and of the Theoscope platform. What we can do after acquisition is we can stop it and we can go and do a deeper dive or examine what we've actually collected. So if we go back to the home screen, we can see this calendar here. And so, Mikhail, would you like to um, mention a little bit about what, what went into putting this together? Yes, thank you, Chris. So we, uh, what you see here is a Grafana dashboard. And what you actually was looking at, what Chris showed to you, that he actually clicked on different buttons and he performed different uh, actions on that, right? Like we go to one the dashboard and he did capture acquisition. He actually chose something, changed the way how it's captured. And it's not a normal behavior what actually Grafana as observability tools uh, famous for. Grafana is uh, normally observing, and as you can see, we use different uh, panels which show you different time series and graphs, and this is what Grafana is, right? What we go here in Theoscope, and this is why Walter Flops is interested in this project, we are going beyond the observability. So you actually have these different custom panels which was created for Theoscope. They are not available as open source. They are part of the Thea application. And this one, for example, it's a vision panel. Vision panel we use uh, direct API calls to the Ray framework to retrieve the specific image, uh, which was in the time frame frame which you selected in the calendar. It show you different classes and annotations. For example, classes and annotations. It's a table components. It's a normal table panels and feature count. It's time series panels. What you see here in navigation, for example, or vision, it's a custom panels, and you can interact with your application play export any images you collected and on vision panels you have different drawers you can export images as well enable bounding boxes disable them if you don't want to see them and uh, with a screen small button blue one you can see it was collected from a screen so this is what we call go be, uh, beyond observability when you not only observe your experiment but you actually perform it and what is the advantages of this uh, method how the is doing 
because you can have one specific application which can capture the data and then you will have another application grafana or some other interface where you see the data but we combine it together the place where we capture the data we see it in real time how it's captured and then we use it for the post-processing and this is groundbreaking great thank you so what we have here is the examine dashboard. And I was just going through some of the features that Mikhail has put in um, for these. And it is a mixture of open source plugins that they provide, but also some custom ones that we have integrated into the application. But we can see here, we have our navigation panel that allows us to look at the different images that we acquired in our acquisition dashboard. And then we also get to see the individual scores, the labels and their positions within the image. Um, for each of these bounding boxes in that screen. So this creates a very uh, dynamic uh, interface, but the nice and beauty of using Grafana for all this is that it is all customizable and resizable, and you can adjust it to whatever experiment you're trying to do and whatever you're trying to look at or obtain from the information. So it's sort of everything in Grafana plus more, like, um, like Mikhail was saying in the, um, about going beyond observability in this case. And so um, the calendar plugin is something that Mikhail and Volkov Labs maintains and is um, open source and available for others to use if they want. So that is real-time image microscopy and a demonstration of the Theoscope platform. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can see that it's a really innovative and also the beautiful design leverage so many tools. Yeah, and maybe I think I can I, I can imagine uh, like maybe one day it can leverage the AI tools, uh, for example, like to chat GPT to generate a more uh, detailed analysis and the leverage uh, and and enhance the, the much more efficiency. Yeah, I think that would be much cooler. Yeah, so yeah, I also have uh, some questions. So um, as a software, so as a this is um I I we already seen uh very beautiful this software design and and, and the whole applications. But I I want to know as the uh, software company, uh what are the biggest challenge uh, you have met when you uh, integrated the entire software and the hardware solutions? Yeah, a big challenge in creating the integrated software and hardware solution that we're showing here today was actually managing dependencies and ensuring compatibility, compatibility within the different software packages and libraries that we're using, but also compatibility with the hardware and the drivers and such. So we had to spend a significant amount of time identifying and in some cases compiling our own dependencies specifically for the ARM64 architecture that the Jetsons use, along with the device and GPU drivers to make that happen. That, th this was a, a, a significant time sink, but once we were able to figure that out, um, a lot of the other things started to kind of fall into place. But as, um, as we now expand our support and such, provisioning devices and stuff will become a bigger challenge. Yes, exactly. So keep the drivers, uh, keep, uh, keep drivers uh, updated and also uh, as seeds. So once you uh, finish the, all the applications design, uh, we can uh, get the, everything ready at the factory to make the device uh, much more or just the, as the off-the-shelf device to make it uh, plug and play uh, for just the, uh, directly uh, run the inference at the edge. Yeah. So and also you showed up uh uh you showed us you using the ULV five, uh, but as the sales group platform, what other algorithms you support? Yeah, it's a great question. So we originally started with YOLO V5 because that's some of the models that we've been using in the microscopy sphere. And we've been slowly progressing and adding more and more uh, different type of model, our model architectures as part of that. And so we have fully integrated into uh, the Theoscope YOLO V7. And we, as of actually, I think just this week, uh, integrated in the Detectron 2, uh, which is a um, uh, code package, which is originally developed by Facebook, so that we can uh, add these very common uh, regional convolutional neural networks um, or, or RCNNs, including the mask and the faster RCNN uh, architectures. And we're uh, slowly, and, and or not slowly, we're quickly trying to get towards the uh, YOLO V8, which was just released. 
uh, as well. And the nice thing about the entire platform and structure is the ability to integrate just about any model that is in the PyTorch or Py um, in the PyTorch um, uh, framework as well uh, as we go. So there's a lot of flexibility to continue to add and develop more uh, capability for different models. That's really great. You're uh, absolutely uh, keep the path with the state of the art algorithms. Yeah, and especially ULV8, that is quite new. Yes, we absolutely, uh, and also we want to look how it performed at the, with the deployment of TensorRD. Yeah. So, um, and also uh, in in your slides, you have showed us uh, the image uh, acquisition and also the labeling and the, this device monitoring. I wonder how about the uh, the deployment process on the embedded JSONs. It's another great question. As Chris uh, already explained, uh, uh, we are using uh, to make sure that all the deployments are compatible between each other with the new drivers and new devices we introduced for, for Fairscope. We are using Docker containers. And with Docker containers, they build nightly using the latest uh, version of our software. And uh, we have we use Balina Cloud to deploy them to the devices as, as we talked before. With, so with Balina, um, it's a great platform and the different devices, they packed in different fleets and depends on the way, what kind of device it is. Is it x86, it's ARM or it's a special ORIN. Uh, it's uh, used a specific o or Docker containers. And this is why we, we know exactly for Orin, we have these containers and they pushed automatically to it. Also with all these devices and the many experiments, which can run for hours, space is, is can be an issue. So this is why we use uh, special cards, external drives, and we use leverage NFS technology as well, which help us to use uh, storage, internal storage on the device if it's available, or we can actually connect multiple devices to the external NFS storage. And this is why I manage everything, the application, the storage, and database in the same place on the network storage. So with the Balina, NFS, and Docker, we know that uh, any device we can introduce to Fiascope, we can support it. Yes, absolutely. Docker makes uh, makes applications design easier and also Balina helps for the fleet management and also the bridging. Yeah, so um, also I, I, I want to know uh, any future uh, plan, uh, any future plans and also what the source group the, and also this application is going to look like for everyone in the future. Yeah, so um, for the Theosco platform, we're looking to expand our support um, for the variety of um, devices and products that you mentioned at the beginning. And specifically, though, also we are looking at the T906A. I got one sitting here, so we're hopefully going to have that running here and adding support for all of the Orin based products and adding that to the fleets and the Theoscope software. With that expanding support for more edge computing devices and GPUs that are coming out from NVIDIA, we hope that will enable us to create what we're calling ad hoc heterogeneous clusters, where we can have multiple Theoscopes uh, act as a hive mind. They cluster together and they will work together. And you can see then having multiple GPUs on this front panel on this home dashboard that you can assign and run uh, multiple models simultaneously, but then also use more resource intensive um, image processing analysis and post analysis quantitation results that are coming up and being used, such as like 3D reconstruction and stuff like that. So we're looking to expand basically um, to different and newer hardware, but also to have that hardware then work together collectively as a device. Yes, that, that would be wonderful because your single application seems like right now is uh, very powerful and easy to use. I I can't wait to see like how you integrated all the all the devices at the cluster. And yeah, and also that uh that whole uh, design will com combine with the NVIDIA cards. I think that is pretty innovative. And yeah, so keep us updated your deployment and I look forward to your story updates. Yeah, and in addition to the the, the hardware and edge computing um, expansion, we also have some stuff for more microscopy specific features. So Kevin, do you want to 
highlight some of that as well as the ML and machine learning? Yeah, we've been um, interfacing for, for over, I think, two years now with the microscopy industry and trying to understand the needs of the different users. And so every day we're, we're trying to integrate um, a bunch of new types of software features that are present that are also hosted directly on the one or the other um, devices as well. And that includes um, things like being able to automatically detect and um, basically run OCR on the metadata as well as scale bar and other features. And so that's tagged directly into the database without the user having to add that in, as well as doing things that um, increase usability for image processing, uh, which is things like brightness, th thresholding, so on and so forth, um, that, that uh, people that do microscopy like me use every day, um, as well as continuing to upgrade and, and update all the different models that I already talked about, and then also the ways to interface with those and, and observe, but then also interact in a sense of like trying to see the um, instant segmentation, the bounding boxes, um, changing colors for classes and all these other different, different types of uh, applications. And so uh, we release updates uh, almost every two to three weeks, thanks to the hard work of nobody, uh, not, of not me, but everybody else um, <laughs> as they do it. And um, those features are, are getting integrated every release that we do. That is a nonstop update progress. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's partly because of Mikhail. Mikhail, what, what are your future plans? <laughs> <laughs> to support all these plans for from Chris and Ken. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, when we build the te technology and the platform, we wanted to use best in the class application the platforms. So the Grafana, we now, uh, what you see right now, it's uh, one of the latest version of Grafana, version 9, 3.2. And uh, later this year, it's going to be Grafana 10. So it's a 10 years of Grafana, and there will be more interesting, exciting features and panels. And of course, we are going to upgrade with that as soon as it's available, that yeah. uh, we're going to test it, right? And uh, it's going to be great. Also, we also use the Mention Ray framework. This is the platform we use for AI. And Ray recently released version 2. So we still have to migrate to Ray 2 and create special Ray data source. So which can support actually multiple different models run heterogeneous clusters, which is what we are going for. And also with the Balina cloud, Balina is always improving. They have a new technology. They are always uh, adding new devices. So we we'll try to keep with the Balina cloud as well. So Grafana, Balina, Ray, and maybe if uh, some scientists need a specific kind of charts, which are not a part of a Grafana yet, we are going to use Apache charts, which is one of the best uh, charging frameworks oh, yeah thank you yeah i'm super glad to have you to join this show together with us here this machine learning powered automated microscope image image analysis leverage so many tools so actually uh your uh your, I, I found out that your team have uh, especially macau uh and vocal labs you you shared a lot, a, a lot uh, useful documentations and also the detailed solution design uh, based on these tools. Yeah, so we also have posted a blog and you previously last year have the Grafana account uh, explaining uh, your applications. Yeah, so uh, with so many resources, I, I believe it will help much, many, many people uh, to get into this technology. Yeah, so I um, thank you. So I look forward to upcoming updates. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for having Thanks us. For having us. Yeah.